the day he was born, it was a story. He had no fluid in his body, a baby boy. The doctor say, Mom, he is dead. Just take him to the morgue, you know, to the hospital, and they will do the rest. Surfing, that wasn't a thing for us to really see. Because you would say about surfing, if you glimpse a magazine, or a certain class of people, you know, and you have to have a lot of money to do that. And I couldn't really fathom Chris was going to get into surfing, but I know he was going to do, be something. They, they couldn't see surfing being something of um, a huge benefit in, in terms of financially or, or anything for me. They couldn't see me being a professional surfer. Even I, I didn't know, I didn't know how I was going to do it or why I was going to do it. So how are you going to try to explain certain things you feel and see on some faraway place? How are you going to explain that to somebody? I think my father was, he was a bit fearful for two reasons, I think. I could be real wrong. Um, one of the reasons was, was I was his big son and I had to stay and, and help out with the family. So I think he was probably afraid that I would go, go off and he wouldn't have anybody to help in, you know, in the field and work and stuff. You know, I used to plant garden. I used to plant like peppers and all them things. But you know, things was hard now, so you know, they had us help me to help myself too. Saturday morning, we had to go like, maybe about four or five miles to this place called Seiko in the bush. My father had a garden and I had to tote like big pumpkin and fig and all kind of thing. And because it was so far in the bush and we couldn't do second trip, you had to take all the produce out. So at 10 years old, I was toting probably a lot of stuff, heavy, heavy things. And my father didn't want to hear that you can't do that. You know, you have to. The other thing is people are always in some way afraid of the unknown. And, and because this was totally out, totally out of what they knew, they were careful. Small way, he used to run away from, well, right there and run down in the back, so. And nobody know where he gone. When they look for him, so he on a piece of wood in the water. I used to talk with him, talk to him about it. He's still doing that, cut the tail. I realized that, that way he like, and then he started to pick up with his friend, and, you know, and with boogie board and all of that and thing. And uh, eventually I leave him on his own. I say, well, if it's that he want to do, like, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, it make no sense trying to get something out of what we don't have in him already, you know? I place his mind on that, so. Through my cousins, I was introduced to surfing. They just started surfing me back in my house, and I just used to look, look on, look on. And they being older, they, they didn't want me to, to try, because they didn't have it all figured out. Some of the earliest days, I remember being in the water, about six years old, we used to go fishing. And my father used to put me on his back, because he had to cross over deep spots in the ocean to get to one rock to another rock to, um, to go and fish on that rock and I'd be holding on and, and when I get brave enough, sometimes I would let go and, and swim around because you have to catch crabs and around the rocks and in the water and things for bait. So that's how come I kind of get, you know, accustomed to the water and, and it wasn't, it was a couple of years later than when I started diving, spear fishing. So initially I wasn't afraid of the water, but I was young and I was advised not to shoot any shark. We had somebody who used to come and buy bananas. He always asking me for shark, no? shark. When all they get a shark, and we used to always say, we don't shoot sharks. His younger sister, who was a little saint, I would say at the time, really, really churchy, she would say, mommy, let's pray for Chris. And I say, okay, fine. Because you know, when they say something amazing, you want to, you know, let them have their way. And I said, okay, fine. And I dive down to this kind of ledge, and I see this little shark. It was little, it was like about, three, four foot. So I go now with my little gun like, mm, and went straight over the shark head. And shark wasn't, didn't even care that I was there. It, it wasn't even intimidated. It was just a minute wrong. And shoot it straight in the head. Whoops! With my little gun, it was a real, my little gun is a little gun. It was, it was powerless. <laughs> Coming back up to the surface, it, 
like it started uh, giving a lot of wiggle and crashing around and, and before I knew it, it slipped out of my hands and I just felt brown. <laughs> I was trying to go deeper. The shark tail and, and things was in my face and I felt its eyes and I stick my thumb straight down in its eyes and squeeze as hard. Then it just make one giant wiggle and, and escape. By that time, I didn't know what to think. I knew I was going to get relics, so. though. <laughs> I was going to get relics from my mother. I mean, the shark bit off a piece of his arm, you know. And it could have probably do more. Yeah. And he came home all in blood. And I mean, he was good, same evening. <laughs> I just accepted things for uh, what they were, you know, like, it's my life, that's your life, you have money, I don't have any. It had its moments when it was, when it was real hard, like, like the younger age, because he was young and he couldn't really help, help out around the house, you know. I've gotten an education that school couldn't give me, you know, with, with surfing and, and traveling, you know, and We would wait in Toko for transportation. The bus wouldn't come or the bus was too full and we didn't get on. And I would get home to Balandra like two in the morning from walking, walk from Toko to Balandra, you know? No electricity, oh well, no big deal. We'll, we'll use candle and moonlight. No water, oh well, we'll just walk down the road and go to the, to the river and, and full water there some, you know? But in some ways, it's, it's perfect too, because you tend to have more of that peaceful side to training. So if took the kids up here by storm, it was something new, but it was also like a dream to be doing it because you've seen it on TV and, and that kind of thing. So it made, you, it made the kids, I think in some ways, your self-esteem go up because you, you feel like it was a part of something. But then you always used to be embarrassed when you hear like people from town come up with their new boards or, or whatever, you know. You don't even have a board shorts or, or anything, you know, but you, but you felt that you was part of something. I remember having a board and walking down the road and I looked back on the road and it was like a trail of water in the road, like a trail for a long distance. He's very detail oriented um, about his boards. And we go over and discuss and for a while there, it was burning up a lot of money on the phone until we figured that out. And we just break it down, okay, I, I could use a little more speed off the bottom or off the top. Chris, where are you? Then, you know, real meticulous on, you know, design and concaves and rockers. And, you know, he'll call up and say, Kirk, look, we got to have more rocker, you know. And it's like, oh, okay, let's go. And it, it, it's, it's this collaborative energy that that's why I got, we got into building boards. He's, he's pushing me as a shaper. This outline, outside line, that's where we're at now. Yeah. So we'll pull it in. You'll see what we got. <laughs> then you'll be sworn to secrecy. It's interesting that it, he is outside the mainstream and we've been kind of outside the mainstream, but we're both, you know, pushing real hard. Um, and it's, I can see that in Chris and it's kind of, I like it. Most surfers, 
in, in contests on the tour um, are riding pretty conservative equipment. Um, the shapes are refined and, and, you know, and all that, but the, the techniques of building the boards, the polyurethane blanks, the wood stringers, everything's been around. It's been around for ages. And Chris is really, he's, he's one of the few guys that have really embraced new technology and are you know, surfing it and plan on surfing it in heats and in contests. Um, I applaud it. It needs to happen. Finance and surfing, those two things go together real good. <laughs> what are the criteria, I ask myself this, what are the criteria to become a professional surfer? Because if you have the money, you could just pay the insurance, pay the membership, and um, pay the entry fee, and then suddenly you're a professional surfer. So it, it comes down to, to money, everything comes down to money, you have to, you have to be able to to afford to go to all the events, you, you are literally paying for points. You're paying to get there, you're paying for the points, and then you move on to the next event to pay for points again. I can't, I can't afford that. You draw the money and that's how it is. Uh, so if you're in my situation who, who don't have any money, which there's, there's plenty of them, the reality of it is they don't, continue to, to do the tour. And they have to um, get a job. <laughs> they have to, to make money to, to eat. It's very expensive to go to some of these spots we have to go to because it's fun. So you have to pay a lot of money in gas and, and oil and things. So you have to shoot over 60 pounds of fish to, to clear the expense. So on any given day, you could shoot um, 120 pounds, 130 pounds a, a snapper and that'll be a good day. For me, it's not about shooting all that fish and thing, you know, I just give away my fish and thing. I don't really care to sell it, you know. For me, I just like to go out and shoot one big fish and get dragged around. Tried to warn the others, but I'm choking. Suffered heavy losses in the open. Hide yourself away until it's over. I won't blame you. Beating around the bush, it all depends That's on you. what you wanted after around the bush. In this one particular spot, I watch it and, and they have like something like a rock. But it was a little distance away and I remember saying, but a rock will be there. And at that same moment, Brian shoot like a big value, about 25 pounds, and the thing started to swim around. And that rock that I was looking at, it wasn't a rock. It was a grouper, and the grouper flew up mid-water and grabbed Brian Cavalli. But Brian's spear was through the Cavalli, like this. And I remember seeing the grouper trying to swallow, swallow the Cavalli. But, and Brian looking at me, and I looking at Brian, and Brian's like, <laughs> like, my fish, my fish can't eat. But I was like, your fish can't eat by a real big fish, <laughs> you know? It taken. It's mouth and it bunks in Brian's fish on the rock, trying to get the rock to help push the fish into his mouth. And that's when I got a side shot and I hit him straight in his head. That was only the beginning of things. This group, when I get that shot, it take off. And I'm talking about like, it take off. When I watch Brian's spear, because he shoot this big cavalli and the grouper tried to eat the spear and the cavalli, his spear bent up all how. So we had to try to fix his spear, straightening it with, with the knee and all kind of thing trying to bend his spear in the water. And my spear lying down at the side of the grouper. Gerard gun ain't big enough or, or powerful enough to stop this grouper and we lose it. And Brian's spear and gun and thing kind of mash up, but his, we could still get off a shot with his gun with a bent up spear, but only as a backup. So me and um, Gerard go down together and uh, the same time, we shot the grouper together and that thing started getting bad in that hole. Real bad, real bad. Started to freak out and get on, but we thought they would have come out. So it's my responsibility, this is how we decided. It's my responsibility, that's my fish. I had to, you know, deal with it. So I had to go down and, and basically physically hold, hug it up and put the grouper belly on my belly like this and kind of bring it up. And then I had to swim the thing to the shore because them fellas didn't really want any part, <laughs> any part of um, swimming the thing to the beach. And get worked on the sand. A big wave come through and work me 
and the group on the sun. Then we finally get into the road, man. We had traffic, uh, traffic line up, cars backed up, people freaking out. I think we get a little picture in, in one of the newspapers about this grouper. Thing was big. It was like 450 pounds. It was huge. Okay, my name's Peter Mel. I'm from Santa Cruz, California. I'm Chris Dennis's friend, and I've known him for uh, a bit. Um, but I've surfed competitively with him, and also uh, he stayed at my house once too, which was pretty cool. You know, he comes from a really beautiful part of the world, right? The Caribbean. Um, you know, I know talking with Chris and the time that I've spent with him um, at my home, getting to share uh, my little piece of the world, you know, my little piece of the planet. Uh, I'm waiting for my invite to come and, and visit the Caribbean there, and I and let him show me his his lifestyle and the way that he lives. Um, and you know, and I think that with, that's the best part about surfing and, and going and experiencing places with friends that you've met. He's done a good job. You know, he's had, I, I commentate and I also surf uh, all these world qualifying series events in North America. And I've been able to see Chris compete. He surfed really well at Trestles. Um, and he brings a flair you don't necessarily see in a lot of competitors, especially the Americans, you know, he, I don't know what it is. It's just the style and approach. It's really relaxed. It's probably the Caribbean life that he's living, you know, all that free diving he does, whatever it is. But, you know, he comes here and he looks relaxed and, you know, he competes at Trestles and he'll come out at Huntington Beach and he'll do, do the job that needs to be done. And it's fun to watch, you know, and it's, that's, I think, kind of more than anything I've noticed when I watch him surf is the fact that I get to see that he's enjoying it. Well, and, uh, you know, Chris comes out here, and I'm sure it's not easy coming out of the Caribbean islands to come here and compete in the U.S. soil and make a name for yourself. I mean, competing on the World Qualifying Series is a, is a hard grind. You know, it's um, many events all over the world, and it costs a lot of dough to get to each and every place. Um, so I think one of the best places for Chris to compete is, is here on, on mainland soil in America and to get into that top 100. The top 100 on the World Qualifying Series basically allows you to get the chance to, to get onto the World Tour, right? So, you know, you compete at all these smaller events because you don't have any points and then you graduate to say into the Prime Series events, which are the six star primes. That's that top 100 echelon. That's where if you make it into that, then you get to compete in all the top events on the World Qualifying Series and you make your jump to try and get on the World Tour. It is a very difficult road. Um, it is a lot of time, a lot of cash, a lot of effort, um, you know, and, and Chris Dennis's chance is, is as good as anybody's. It's gonna take that little break. Maybe it's gonna be his equipment. Maybe it's gonna be that one event that you taste victory, you know, and 
yeah, I give him chances. I give him a thumbs up. He's just got to do it. And, uh, you know, and I think that what it's going to take more than anything is support from the people around him, um, his sponsors, to give him that chance. So pretty much if you get sponsored, and your first year if you finish in the top 200, your second year you could finish in the top 100, it'll take you two to three years. Is all over the world. And it takes a lot of money to get to these events. It takes a team. Uh, you can't do it by yourself. It takes a whole team, if you're coming from a small island like this, to help arrange the means necessary to get to these places. And, you know, that's going to be a struggle for Chris because his talent and his surfing ability is not what is going to limit him. It's going to be his ability to get to the venues and to get the exposure that he needs to try to advance his career. A lot of support, a whole support system to get him there. Well, you don't have any chances unless you get sponsored, right? Yeah. I'ma get my freak on, my freak on, my f f funky freak on, my freak on, my freak on, my freak freak on. I'ma get my freak on, my freak on, my f f funky freak on, my freak on, my freak on, my. I always around surfing, but never really around like all the cameras and and all that too much. It's a camera for taking photos of me. We feel great for him, eh? We feel really proud because I, I realize, I tell my wife, I say, well, is it that he wants to do, let him do it, let him go ahead. And then he tell me, well, he's trying to make a little career, you know, of like that for him, his own self and thing. I say, well, all right, you fix up. This is very important as to what event I get into. This is going to basically dictate mm -hmm. my whole year in terms of points and ratings and yeah. where I am. I have no room for, for errors. Yeah. I have no room for, and, and this happened, I've, I've gone to contests and see the best. They just get, they get put out in their first heat mm -hmm. because the ocean. It was just a bad day. Yeah, the yeah. ocean didn't come through or, or yeah. so. A joy to have around. It's nice to see someone from Trinidad, really, in Tobago, really putting in a strong effort, you know, coming to a lot of the contests. And, you know, it's obvious you can see in his surfing that it's improved it. You know, most people with more competition do improve, and Chris is no exception to that rule. He's definitely coming along nicely. Second round. That's the WQS for you, you know. If you get the waves, you'll pass. If you don't get the waves, well, that's how it goes. I think the key is to just kind of be consistent and just kind of let stuff like this pass, you know. But it's hard. For Chris to make it in the top 100, he's really going to have to dig deep and look more solid, you know, in your in your approach. You know, I think it's a you know he's got a good chance, but you're going to have to like 
find that, you know, more explosiveness, you know, in opening maneuvers. This is probably, you know, a way to really draw a judge's attention, you know. You come out of the gates banging it, you know. The more solid your first turn, it's like it suddenly... It's real difficult when you don't live up to some expectation, you know. Is this dream really just going to be a dream? Surfside always had a bad reputation for uh, outsiders coming in. And so I, I just said, Chris, when we go out in the water, just let me go out a little bit. You kind of follow my lead and let me do the talking, more or less. So we go out in the water, and I introduce him to the local crew out there and such. And anyway, he took off on a wave inside, not outside. He absolutely shreds this thing just off the top wax it four or five times, roundhouse cut back, comes back in, it gets a little barrel, kicks out, kind of a flyaway kick out. And this one buddy of mine, Aaron, he goes, where'd you say he was from? I go, Trinidad. He goes, do they all surf like that? His favorite board was a chili board at that time. And uh, he really felt that he didn't have a choice. He had to surf where the waves were. And they were, of course, breaking on the rocks. And that's exactly what he did. He, I mean, everybody just stood back and said, what is this guy doing? And he was able, he had the ability to, to skim just above the surface of the rocks and ride the wave. And of course, he it destroyed his board, but he advanced for a while. And uh, eventually it caught up to him. And it showed you right away in, in front of everybody what his, his abilities were. And that, you know, he wasn't afraid to to get bruised or cut up. As far as his chances of making it, you know, in, in, in the ASP or, or the WQS and hopefully advance to the WCT, I mean, Chris is as good as anybody out there, without a doubt. We got to watch him in Barbados. 
at Soup Bowl and the explosive nature of his surfing can compare to anybody on the planet, without a doubt. He just needs some breaks, just needs a couple of shots at advancing, and he'd be right there. If he got the financial backing so he could really get uh, a good shot at it, I believe he would penetrate that uh, 100 mark. You know, and It comes back at you. You want to do something for him. You, you realize you know, that he's not a, a person of privilege or he, he comes from humble beginnings, but it doesn't stop him, and that's, that's what people see. Brazil and uh, had a good night rest so yeah that's about it anticipating what what will happen what could happen the, my first six star so we'll see yeah. I knew where I was going to stay I was going to sleep on like this little tin little kind of couch thing but it, it would have been very cheap in terms of me getting a place there's a knock on the door I couldn't tell what it was saying because it was in all in Portuguese. They had guns. I was just sitting there saying, well, if I had to die, this is a stupid way to go, you know? <laughs> losing once is one thing. I mean, losing back to back is quite another thing. I ain't know, um, I never had to deal with that. I'm probably saying at first, nah, now would be a good time to quit. <laughs> but no, I'll be like, there's just another thing to get past. You think I haven't really played those situations over my head? You know, many situations I've played over the years in my head about not being able to do um, the tour. You know, I do have a lot of time or a lot of opportunities. You also have to be smart about this because you also have to know when it's time to to just kind of to quit to her. Some neighbors of mine in Surfside, California, are a couple, and they're both principals of inner city schools. And I introduced them to Chris, and he was wonderful and uh, to them. And they asked him if he would come to their school and speak in front of the children. They come from underprivileged families, and they'd never met a dark surfer, professional surfer. They'd met football players, baseball players. And Chris said he was honored to go, and he went, and he made such an impression on these children and gave them such hope that they could achieve anything if they put their mind to it and work hard and stay healthy. And my friends, my neighbors, um, were so happy that their children had met Chris, and they wrote to his country and wrote letters for him and whatever it took just because they were honored that Chris came to their school and spoke and he was such a dignified representative of the surf culture. So the Surfing Development Program is a, a program designed by myself and the Surfing Association to develop surfing in Trinidad and Tobago. Its focus is on uh, the, the rural areas of, of both Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's a young program now, we're just getting started. Chris is uh, uh, one of the instructors with our program and it, he's you know, been of course uh, an inspiration to all the kids on that coastline because you know, he's from there. He's from Balandra, and um, in a sense, he's a model for, I think, potentially what the, the program could achieve. Within all of my travels, I've seen the difficulty in smaller communities, especially the Caribbean, in getting the type of exposure needed for some of these young athletes to be able to travel abroad and gain more experience. And that is one of the goals of the Western Atlantic Surf Series, is to try to bring some exposure to, to some of this, these young talents. With role models like Chris Dennis, it is possible that sponsors are gonna start looking a little bit more towards the Caribbean for these athletes. He is single-handedly paving the way for some younger athletes to pursue their dreams and, and one day end up on the ASP qualifying tour and, and maybe even the world tour. You know, there's a lot of stereotypes involved in surfers these days and it's really refreshing to see someone like Chris because he is a true athlete. He wakes up in the morning and he trains. He eats, breathes, lives surfing and training and being in physical and mental health at all times. And that's what it takes to advance yourself 
in the competitive surfing arena. You can't just go out there and be some guy who thinks he's gonna hang out on the beach and drink beer all day. People come up to me and go, you look real happy when you surf, you know? It, it looks like if you would stay out there all, all day, even all night, it looks like you belong out there, and I, and I feel that way. You, you tend to learn a lot of things about yourself when, when you're in, in situations where things are not going as planned. Like, as for now, there's still plenty of that competitive fire left and, and plenty of that kind of life, you know? I, I still dream of uh, hearing that heat horn blue and, and trying to sue for that level. But where's the love? Never let them win, never let them try, never lose the faith. We will learn to fly. Stand up for your right now. Come and join the fight now. And with the beat of the drum, baby, and you are going to hold your hands up high. Never let the system control. Cry. We got to rise above, find a